On our planet, there seems to be an infinite number of beautiful places one can visit with an equal number of spectacular things to admire. It requires nothing more than a curiosity to observe what is all around you. The miracle of nature manifests in countless ways, from breathtaking vistas to the simple movements of a common heifer. The purpose of this program is to present you with the extraordinary diversity of our miraculous blue planet so that you can discover these things for yourself. Once upon a time, this was a single country known as Rhodesia. Today, it lies divided by a national boundary. Zimbabwe was initially southern Rhodesia and lies to the south of Victoria Falls along the river Zambezi. Zambia was initially northern Rhodesia and lies on the other bank of the river. Zimbabwe is a landlocked country in the southeast of Africa. Its southern border is with the country of South Africa. According to archaeologists, the earliest records indicate that first human settlements in this area reach back to the third century. Welcome to Zimbabwe, a country that could have been a real paradise had it not been for a single man, the dictator Robert Mugabe. He celebrated his 88th birthday this year and has ruled Zimbabwe for 32 years. For decades, Zimbabwe has served the African continent as the main supplier of wheat. Today, as a result of Mugabe's rule, four out of five people are unemployed and starvation is commonplace. Among other things, Mugabe confiscated the land of white farmers and divided it among people whose loyalty he could depend on but who were, at the same time, not up to the job. Few other African countries enjoy such an abundance of natural wealth. Zimbabwe is rich in gold, coal, chromium, silicon, and nickel. Over 12 million people live in Zimbabwe, most of them native Africans. Many white people used to live here as well, and most lived here in 1975 when they formed 5% of the total population. Today, this number is negligible. 80% of the inhabitants are the Shona people. The second largest ethnic group is the Ndebele people, living mostly in Matabele land in the western part of the country. They conquered the Matabele land plains in the 1830s. Until then, this area was inhabited by the Sana people, otherwise known as Bushmen. Zimbabwe ranks high in some pretty sad statistics. Life expectancy, for example, has been reduced from 61 to 34 over the last 20 years. The Matobo mountain range is the spiritual heart of Zimbabwe. Matobo stands for Bold Head. It is a place where many battles and reconciliations took place.
The caves found in the Motobo Mountains hide many mysterious wall paintings depicting hunting scenes. Some are as old as 10,000 years. Human remains and prehistoric tools reaching back 35,000 years were also discovered in these caves. Cecil John Rhodes, a British entrepreneur, after whom the country was initially named Rhodesia, has his tomb atop this mountain range. Zimbabwe's main crop is maize. Similarly, as Europe was once saved by American potatoes many centuries ago, Zimbabwe is kept afloat thanks to maize, also originally from America. Mr. Matuta's motor mill is an important venue for villagers from near and far who grow corn on their meager plots. They come bearing sacks of the crop and the mill's employees rapidly turn it into the much desired maize flour. The old and worn machine makes the job rather risky. Fingers are constantly in danger of being chopped off. The flour grinding process always attracts curious onlookers. The owners, on the other hand, prefer a nap in the shade. The flour is ready and the pleased owner heads home. Means of transportation is directly linked to the state of the wallet. Sadza is Zimbabwe's national dish. It is a thick maize puree. In slightly varying forms, it's the staple food of more than half of the African continent. Mrs. Constance Matuto prepares some in her clay kitchen. When seasoned with a little oil and spices, it makes for a tasty and nourishing meal. Cutlery is nowhere to be seen, but the crockery is lovely. The future of 21st century Africa is directly dependent on factors that have long been taken for granted on other continents. Enough quality schools to ensure education and adequate supply of water, respectively. Water is abundant in Zimbabwe, particularly during the rainy season. Drinking water, however, remains scarce. It is fetched from wells that are few and far between. The situation is made significantly worse during the dry season when sources dry out. Bad times set in for all living creatures, people, cattle, and wild animals alike. Desperate times call for desperate measures. The locals make decisions that may seem unusual to us. One such measure is making use of the so-called rain whisperer. Fitting equipment is required for the job in the form of a magic staff, black skirt, and a hat made from monkey and civet hide. The sacred ceremony in one of the mysterious Nyelele mountain caves in the Matabele mountains is out of reach to whites were believed to have transparent ears and could not hear God's voice in any case. 
It seems that God has been merciful, just like every year at the onset of the rainy season. After all, who cares whether the rain was brought by nature or by supernatural forces? What matters is that it is raining and hard. The rain has ceased. There is a rainbow, and the endless pastures of the Huangdi National Park are lush and green. Ostriches stroll peacefully, using their sharp vision to spot predators lurking in the tall grass. Evil tongues claim that an ostrich has a larger eye than brain. So what? It doesn't seem to bother him. The African bush is overflowing with life. Animals gather to drink each evening at natural water holes. The juiciest and sweetest grass lines the water holes. Many lovely plants and trees are in bloom. Acacias, sturdy baobabs, as well as healing kegelias. The locals claim that the fruits of the bush cure just about everything. of life here highlights the intricacy of the ecosystem and the importance of every animal. This is the time to slow down and really look around. Many animal species that normally have little in common are united by the need to protect themselves on the open plains. For this reason, ostriches, zebras, and wildebeests are seen here living as one. The arrangement is mutually beneficial. Some have better vision, while others have better hearing, and as such, together they have a better chance of spotting approaching danger. There is power in numbers. Wildebeests are truly remarkable creatures. It's almost as if God had a few bits left over when creating the animal kingdom and used those bits to create a half horse, half cow as a prank. In other words, the wildebeest. In reality, wildebeests are relatives of the antelope in the Bovidae family. The tallest land animal, the giraffe, also lives in the Huangue Park. The males reach a respectable height of 5.5 meters and weigh around a ton. Arabian merchants once graced the giraffe with the name Zarafa, meaning the one that walks fast. Its Latin name, Giraffa camel leopardalis, is a reminder of the mistaken idea that it was a cross between a camel and a leopard. The giraffe's height provides it with a remarkable view and enables it to feed on vegetation inaccessible to other species. In everyday life, though, this height presents a complication. Even such mundane feats as quenching thirst entail a complicated operation. Due to their height, giraffes must regulate their blood pressure to prevent brain damage when lowering their heads. Pride of the Huangue National Park is the rhino. According to one of the rangers, Godfrey Kanye, annually poachers in Zimbabwe kill tens of rhinos. Although it seems to be a silly superstition, powder made from the rhino horn is still used today in traditional Asian medicine as a potent aphrodisiac.
The rhinoceros, together with the elephant, rank among Africa's mightiest animals. In Zimbabwe, as anywhere else in the world, the lion is the ruler of the animal kingdom. This pride of four lionesses and four playful cubs are resting peacefully having had their days fill. A curiosity is an electronic collar worn by one of the lionesses, which enables scientists to monitor the movement of this pride while in the bush. Alongside its wildlife, Zimbabwe has many other attractions. With Zambia, it shares a world rarity. In the Ndebele tongue, it is called Amanza Tunkayo, meaning water falling upwards. Such a unique sight is to be seen in Victoria Falls. The waterfall was discovered in 1855 by a Scottish traveler and missionary, David Livingstone, who proclaimed that such a stunning sight is certainly admired by angels as they fly overhead. The waterfall was named in honor of the Queen of England, Victoria. On its way toward the Indian Ocean, the 1,700-meter-wide Zambezi River suddenly drops into a 100-meter depth. The spray is propelled through the canyon as if driven by a huge fan, and thus the effect of rising water is created. During the rainy season, when 10,000 cubic meters per second flow through the river, the spray reaches 500 meters high. The wild rapids on the river Zambezi are tamed by the massive Kariba Dam built at the end of the Batoka Pass. The dam has been essential to the development of the mining industry, which requires substantial amounts of electrical energy. On the other hand, the dam has driven out the Tonga tribe, who inhabited the river's banks and lived off fishing. Long gone are the romantic times when hydroplanes were the only means of travel from England to southern Africa. Today, there are much more prosaic means of transportation across Zimbabwe. The bravest of the wildlife admirers may wish to encounter Africa's deadliest animal, the hippo. There are up to 20 hippos in a single bay. The hippopotamus, although a vegetarian and apparently clumsy, 
is capable of decent acceleration. Hippos are territorial and can be driven to furious rage when their habitat is compromised. The locals claim that whoever crosses a hippo's path seldom gets away alive. As this bad-tempered specimen clearly demonstrates, the hippo is well equipped to bite an uninvited intruder in half. No need to test all theories, surely. A storm is headed our way. During the rainy season, it rains more or less nonstop for almost a hundred days. The storms irrigate the scorched land and dried out riverbeds, as well as water levels and lakes, rise by several meters. There is no need for wildlife to migrate all the way to water holes, and so the already slow rhythm of life slows down even more. These little hunters have caught meat for lunch in the form of some unappetizing looking frogs. The housewives blanch the frogs alive. Then they are cleaned, gutted, and slow cooked in brine until tender. It makes for an unattractive dish, but one that would probably work well in a French restaurant. Waiting for the meat to cook is the perfect opportunity to tell stories. Story and fable telling skill is an art form in Africa, as is dancing and singing. Mrs. Bongi Nakonda recounts the story of a jackal and a crow for the children. It is the equivalent of the fable about the cunning fox that stole a bit of cheese from the mad crow, only here, in Africa, there is a jackal instead of a fox and a chunk of meat instead of cheese. The frogs are done, and everyone awaits a piece of the delicacy. Lack of foodstuffs is a problem in Zimbabwe. The people in the famine-stricken areas, and the children in particular, are dependent on foreign aid. These kids count among the luckier ones. Zimbabwe, a beautiful and naturally wealthy country with enchanting nature on the surface and immeasurable mineral wealth beneath the surface, made poor by a man. People die of starvation here. Let us pray that this splendid part of Africa has happier times and wiser rulers in store for it. Lisa Lekule, Zimbabwe. Farewell. Our planet, there seems to be an infinite number of beautiful places one can visit, with an equal number of spectacular things to admire. It requires nothing more than a curiosity to observe what is all around you. The miracle of nature manifests in countless ways, from breathtaking vistas to the simple movements of a common heifer. 
The purpose of this program is to present you with the extraordinary diversity of our miraculous blue planet so that you can discover these things for yourself. Today's journey in search of incredible miracles of nature begins in the Canary Islands. Lanzarote is of a volcanic origin. Volcanic activity created a fantastical landscape similar to that on Mars. On Gran Canarias, we will witness a traditional harvest of a crop that has been brought to the rest of the world from here, sugarcane. We will wrap up today's episode in the Moroccan province of Guelmin, home to a nomadic tribe whose inseparable companions are camels. The foamy waves of the Atlantic Ocean wash the shores of Lanzarote, one of the Canary Islands belonging to Spain. The island owes its unique natural characteristics to a series of volcanic eruptions between 1730 and 1824 that completely changed the landscape. The island is predominantly a red-brown desert made of igneous lava. It is hardly surprising then that the landscape is often compared to that of inhospitable Mars. The landscape icon of Lanzarote is the Montañas del Fuego, meaning fire mountains. These mountains are literally an open textbook on volcanology. The bare landscape offers very little moisture and almost nothing grows here apart from a few endemic types of succulents and lichens. While the people of Lanzarote literally walk on hot ground, there is currently no threat of more volcanic eruptions. A few meters below the Earth's surface, the temperatures reach as much as several hundred degrees Celsius. For centuries, the local people have been fighting bravely against heat and insufficient moisture. The round shapes in the La Cherie Valley are not volcanic craters, but artificially built vineyards. The tradition of creating Malvasia in the Rubicon region is some 300 years old. Lanzarote is even more famous for its cheese production than wine cultivation. The cheese is made from goat's milk because goats are capable of surviving on the very sparse vegetation available here. Some types of the renowned local cheeses ripen up to two years. Most, however, are consumed immediately or the second day after being made. The local cheeses are well known for their earthy taste, where the heat of the climate and the moist ocean winds blend. The cheese is made using sea salt and the rays of sun blaze the landscape daily. While fresh water is scarce all over Lanzarote, there is an abundance of seawater all around. In the Hanaubio Bay, sea salt has been extracted from the ocean for centuries. The method remains unchanged. The water is poured into shallow vessels and the sun takes care of the rest. The locals have learned to make use of the sun as well as other sustainable natural resources. Most of Lanzarote's demand for electric energy is met through windmills. Teguiz, the island's ancient capital, has not changed much. The way of life remains very traditional. 
cockfighting is an integral part of it, and the famous cockfighting school is in Teguiz. The sharp spurs of the colorful warriors must be covered during practice because they could hurt or even kill the opponent. This tradition may seem cruel to some, and it is, but nature has made sure that the cock's instinct is to fight. While the landscape of Lanzarote is fascinating, life here is tough. The youth leave for cities or the mainland in search of a more comfortable existence, and the long cultivated terraced fields lie fallow. Slowly, the harsh nature claims back what the farmers have taken from it centuries ago. Cacti are not grown on Lanzarote only to please the eye. The vast Opuntia plantations make it appear to be somewhere in Mexico, which is understandable, since this is where the Opuntia was imported from. Opuntia is usually grown for its sweet fruits. This is not the case on Lanzarote. Here, the cochineal is bred on it. Larvae of this insect contain the natural dye carmine, used in cosmetics and also in the food industry for the manufacture of lipsticks or as the colorant in Campari. The larvae are gray at first glance, but if crushed, the color appears. If the label on a product states E120 colorant as an ingredient, it most likely originates from these insects. Thick clouds are accumulating above another of the Gran Canaria Islands, Gran Canaria. In its name, there is the adjective gran, meaning big, but in diameter, it measures less than 50 kilometers. Gran Canaria, similar to Lanzarote, is of a volcanic origin, but here, volcanic activity ceased much earlier. The uncompromising waves of the Atlantic Ocean break against the majestic cliffs, just as they did in 1492 when Christopher Columbus stopped by here to replenish the supplies during his famous exploration journey. The landscape on Gran Canaria is much more malleable and richer than that of Lanzarote. Fresh water is not abundant, but there is a little more of it available here, and so Gran Canaria is by far the greenest of all the Canary Islands. Very little information is known about the Guanches, the natives of Gran Canaria, who lived here as far back as a thousand years. There is proof that the Guanches dwelt in mountain caves. The caves maintain a pleasant temperature even when it is excruciatingly hot outside. The Guanches used caves like Cenobia de Valaron to live in, but above all, they used them to store food. Many of the locals still live in small houses adjacent to the mountains, and their rooms were carved by bare hands of their predecessors. Beneath the tiny bell tower, there is a church consecrated to the Virgin de la Cuevita, the Virgin Mary of the cave carved in rock. Legend has it that it was once upon a time discovered in the thicket. The most important symbol of Gran Canaria are not caves, but a tree. 
a tree protected by the law. The Canary Island pine is endemic, therefore it is only found here. These pines absorb all the moisture they need from air. It is a sort of camel among trees. It's capable of accumulating more moisture than it requires immediately, and as such, it survives long periods of drought on the inhospitable slopes of Gran Canaria. The timber of local pines is very hard and so resists all kinds of pest attacks. This characteristic is welcome in wood carving. The older the timber, the more resin it contains. The resin gives the wood a reddish hue and adds to its hardness. An ingenious water filtration device is also made from the Canary Island pine. The water drips through a bowl made out of porous stone, which cools it and maintains its freshness. An important local crop is caña, sugarcane in other words. Although it's now being cultivated only on a small area of the island, it was first imported to America from the Canary Islands. In sugarcane cultivation, it is necessary to carefully remove dry leaves and bad stalks that have not grown properly and could slow down the growth of the healthy ones. The hard labor involved in sugarcane cultivation was the reason why sugar refineries were moved to America. Sugarcane is harvested manually here, unlike in America, where sugarcane fields are burned. Stems as high as five meters are chopped and harvested by hand. Favorite drink, guarapo, brought from America, enriched Gran Canaria in return. It is easy to make. Freshly pressed sugarcane juice with mint leaves added to taste and to lessen the sweetness. Gran Canaria is windy, and so banana or tomato plantations must be protected using foils so that the gusts of wind do not damage the plants. Local bananas are well known. Cutting their flowers is an important task because it has a considerable effect on the final taste and appearance of the bananas. While in farming, it is a curse the strong wind is a blessing for the local wind power stations. It often tears off the protective foil and damages the crops. This is not the Sahara. Although the sandy dunes of the southern part of the island do resemble it, it goes without surprise, since Africa is a stone's throw away. The wind forever moves the sand, changing the appearance of the dunes 
and covering the occasional footprints we might make. The beaches that three million tourists visit each year are also in the south. Most of the visitors are content with crystal clear waters and sandy beaches. The other natural wonders of Gran Canaria usually go unnoticed. There's no Cesar Monique on Gran Canaria to ensure that such an enchanting island doesn't become a uniform tourism resort in which the fascinating and unique natural phenomena slowly disappear. With the setting sun, we bid Gran Canaria goodbye. We now travel to the Moroccan province of Guelmin, which lies in the very south of the Moroccan kingdom. Guelmin, the land of nomads and camels. This is where the world's largest desert, the Sahara, touches the Atlantic Ocean. Even though the original nomadic way of life disappears slowly, many still live as their predecessors did. They traverse the desert with their leather and fabric tents. Each family has dromedaries, single humped camels in addition to their tents. After humans, the Arabs have long considered the camel to be Allah's greatest creation. The biggest camel market in Africa takes place in the capital city, also called Guelmin. A white camel is worth the most because it has a particularly well-developed sense of orientation and memory. A white camel is a must at the front of every caravan. A black camel, which is heftier and stronger than other camels, is also in great demand at the market. An adult camel weighs around half a ton and costs some 10 to 15,000 dirhams, which comes to about two to three thousand dollars. The purchased animals are not handled with much consideration. No wonder, a camel is a calm but very stubborn animal. A little further north, there are Arpuntia plantations. Here, they are grown just for their tasty fruits. Initially, mostly wheat was cultivated here, but it didn't do so well. Many farmers, therefore, left the region. The Opuntia, which forms the basis of the region's economy, is slowly bringing the farmers back.
the fleshy Oputi leaves are also utilized. There is not much else in terms of vegetation, and so chopped opuntia leaves are fed to livestock. The Atlantic winds also influence the climate in Guelmin. The winds have chiseled the granite rocks in the Tafrot Valley into fantastic shapes. This rock, standing tall above Berber houses, is named Napoleon's Hat because of its shape. Mountain goats and sheep graze below the hat. Grass is scarce, and so they eat mostly the arganu trees. Healthy trees live 150 to 200 years and do not grow anywhere else than here in the Moroccan mountains. They bear nuts all year round. The goats living in such harsh conditions find a valuable nutrient in these nuts. It is so vital that the goats have learned to climb the trees to reach them. Argan nuts are also an important crop for the local people. The women press an expensive oil, commonly used in cosmetics, from them. The nuts must firstly be rid of their fleshy skins. They are then beaten open, and the roasted cores are poured into a manual stone press from which a thick substance is acquired. It is then soaked in water, and dry matter used for feeding domestic animals is condensed out of it. What remains on the bottom is the valuable oil. In Guelmin too, the waves crush with enormous force against the rocks. Some of the breakers turn over fishing boats and wash them ashore. The loveliest place on the coast of Guelmin is a place called Lexira. A truly unique phenomenon is found here, a rock made up of granite and red sandstone. Waves and sea currents have chiseled the sandstone on the almost eight kilometer long beach. Everything we've seen today proves that even the smallest things may be miracles. As the sun sets beyond the horizon, so we too bid the Guelman coast goodbye. Our journey to the miraculous nooks of our planet comes to an end for now. On the next exploration of our compelling and bountiful planet Earth, we'll go to Mexico and the Caribbean. In the Mexican province of Veracruz, we'll encounter marvelous orchids and learn a thing or two about vanilla. On the Cayman Islands, we'll delight in the splendor of abundant marine life and meet the reptiles that gave the islands their name. That's all right here on Miracles of Nature. We hope you'll join us. Hey.